Good evening and welcome to tonight's In Conversation uh, at the Royal Society of Medicine. It is a real pleasure to be here with you all and to welcome Dr. David Knott, OBE. Uh, my name is Professor Henrietta Bowden-Jones. I'm the uh, President of Psychiatry here at the Royal Society of Medicine. And before I read David's, uh, David's biography, I really want to encourage all of you, uh, the 1,300 people who are booked in to see us tonight, um, to ask some questions. A Q&A function works really well and adds some sort of unexpected component to the evening. So please interact with us. We'd love to hear from from you. Um, David, welcome. Lovely to see you. And, uh, and thank you for joining us. I am very aware that you were in the operating theatre until uh, very, very recently this evening. So very grateful to you. Um, so Dr. David Knott, consultant surgeon at St. Mary's, author of the best-selling memoir, War Doctor, uh, surgery on the front line, specialist in vascular and trauma surgery. And David also as, is a specialist um, and performs cancer surgery at the Royal Marsden Hospital. Uh, he's an authority on laparoscopic surgery and was the first surgeon to combine laparoscopic and vascular surgery. For the past 25 years, he has taken unpaid leave from his NHS job to work for international aid agencies and has provided surgical treatment to patients in conflict and catastrophe zones from Bosnia, Afghanistan, Sierra Leone, to Chad, Yemen and Iraq, to list, to list just a few of, of these countries. And I know we will be hearing a lot more from him about them. In 2015, he founded the David Knott Foundation with his wife, Ellie, to train surgeon, uh, surgeons across the world uh, on conflict zones. Uh, welcome, David. What an introduction. I'm going to... I'm going to, um, wow, the questions have already started, so that I'm very excited now, but the first question is mine, and it's going to be an unexpected one. Uh, I'm not going to ask you immediately about the foundation. I, I want to know, after all these years of living your life between calm, relatively calm places, and then uh, more terrifying places, witnessing all sorts of things. What are your thoughts about human beings? Are they fundamentally good or fundamentally bad? Wow, what, 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 a, <laughs> what a question to begin with, Henrius. Well, I think, um, I think human beings are fundamentally good, to be really honest with you. Um, I, I think that it's power that really distorts human beings in, in one way. And I think, you know, we know who are good leaders and uh, who have the ability to make people understand what they mean, et cetera, et cetera. And we follow those sort of people uh, and they are good leaders and they're good, good to the uh, people or the populace that they're dealing with. Um, there are other people who also use power in a divisive way, I think. And the divisive way is that they will hold on to power and will do anything that it takes to hold on to power. And these people also, from what I think about war zones, et cetera, is that they surround themselves by um, tiers of other people who also um, want to stay in power and will do anything to uh, stay in power. And I'm talking about Syria, for example, um, you know, the, the, the regime, the Assad regime going there. I mean, they will do anything to stay in power, destroy their country, destroy the civilian life, destroy what's going on around them, the infrastructure, the beautiful uh, monuments and the architecture of their country. They will destroy it just to stay in power. And I think it's those are the people that are the bad people in life. And we know lots of other people that, that are, um, use their power in a bad way. Um, and they sometimes also seem to be slightly unstoppable. And I, I don't understand why they're unstoppable, but I think people um, become too scared of them. They become untouchable and it just perpetuates the, the issues. And I mean, we, we know, you know, in politics in the UK and also in medicine or whatever, you know, we know those sort of people that, that are very powerful. And I think it's something that they engender in their own self to become powerful because 
I think some people are too scared to say anything to them to try and pull them down. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally, I think people are very good, but the ones that are very bad are the ones that misuse power. Uh, that, that's a, a very optimistic start to tonight, and I'm really, I had no idea what you were going to say, but it does feel a very optimistic start, so, so the few, the few have such a strong impact on, on, on the many who are actually fundamentally good. Um, uh, there are people already saying, uh, first of all, um, uh, what a great question and a very good answer. Someone is saying that working in war zones has kept you looking very young, um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and someone saying what a great Great honor to meet you this evening, um, and and I will and I will and are asking questions that I am going to be asking. But lovely to see people engaged. So I, well, as I was preparing, I, I saw I, I watched some of your interviews. Some of them actually brought me to tears, which is and doesn't happen very often. Um, I felt very I had I felt a lot of empathy with the pain that you must be carrying at times, um, and uh, I wanted to know. How does living every day with the reality of war, because that now is within you, it's in your molecular structure in a way, you know, you are carrying that wherever you are, whether it's a Chelsea or St Mary's, how does that impact on everyday life for you? Um, a, a, a good question. I mean, I have it always in the back of my mind what, uh, you know, I, 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 I know what people are suffering from. I know what people uh, are going through in various countries of the world and various war zones and you know we were watching Gaza very recently and I was there in 2014 I know a lot of the people that that were that were suffering and I just know what it is like to be in those environments um, but of course they they have to stay there and it, and we can always come in and out and we can come back to our pleasant you know uh, room uh, uh, with our books and calmness and quietness etc cetera, etc cetera. but a lot of people living life is very tough and very hard and we don't really see that and we don't really understand what the hardship is like for many people and I think sometimes when I'm sitting in my consulting room and you know people do come to see me with various problems and to me you know I have to put on a different head because the, the head that I would put on if I came back from a war zone would be completely different from the head that I need to put on to be able to treat that patient, because that patient may have something that's, you know, worrying for them, where re in reality, there is no worry at all for that patient. They don't need to worry about it. If, if I put them in a war zone, they'd be certainly worrying about something else. They'd be worrying for their life, they'd be worrying for their family, they'd be worrying for their significant injuries that their family members have or they have, or the psychological effect of what's around them and things like that. And I think it, it's very difficult sometimes to um, sit and listen to people's woes when you know that, you know, I mean, of course you have to understand that it's, it's their woes and, and that's what I'm here for to talk to them about. But in reality, if you really think about it, they've got nothing to worry about. The majority of people got nothing to worry about. The, um, this interesting concept of a hierarchy of worries uh, makes me reflect on the numbers. Your website talks about the David Knott Foundation having helped, you know, three million people. And I was thinking, actually, it isn't three million people. It's vastly larger because in conflict zones, in difficult countries, if you don't have a livelihood because you're actually maimed or dead, your family is not going to survive. Uh, uh, as a unit uh, and the individuals may perish because of that so suddenly I was multiplying three million by five thinking that's probably a better reality in relation to your impact do you have any thoughts on that and then I'll go to the questions of which there are beginning to be quite a few that are relevant to this conversation well, very much so I mean I've just come back from uh, Marib in the Yemen and uh, because of the Covid crisis uh, the foundation wasn't able to do anything for about 18 months so as soon as there was an opportunity arose um, and we heard that there was a um, people were requ requiring help uh, in Marib in the Yemen. Now, Marib is a town in, in the middle northern part of Yemen, which is under the government control. And there's severe fighting going on between the Al-Houthi regime 
and the Yemeni government to take control of Maghreb because Maghreb has all the oil fields and things like that. And so there's intense fighting going on. But this fighting has been going on for quite some time and it's only intensifying recently. And so a group of us, two orthopedic surgeons, myself and another general surgeon went off uh, with our knowledge of the foundation and also we spent time operating. Now what we found was that you're absolutely right. Um, there were so many patients that had so many problems that weren't treated. There were so many people with holes in their bones, holes in their arms and legs and, and poor management of their injuries. And they, these people have been festering for three or four years at home without having any proper treatment. So they can't go out and work. So that you're right, the family doesn't get any, any support or help or anything like that. So to be, to be really honest with you, it was an absolute joy to go there. And we operated on 45 or 46 people uh, and got them going again, basically. We, we did a, I, I turned into a plastic surgeon, so I did a lot of the flaps and uh, to cover various bones. The orthopedic surgeons were working hours on end to reconstruct the bones. And I was doing the plastic, putting the, covering the bones and covering the skin and doing skin grafts and everything else to try and sort the people out that had all these festering uh, Ill, Ill uh, injuries. And that's, that is the beauty of being able to go out and suddenly change somebody's life that they can go back to work, they can start walking around, they, don't, they can have their external fixator taken off and they're back to um, some sort of reality again. But the problem is that this is just the tip of the iceberg and 44 patients over two weeks is what, 0.05% of what is really happening. What one needs to be there is, is to be there for five years to make some sort of um, intervention of, of, of making life better for people. So it's, it's a, there's a huge problem, not just the war and the gunshot wounds and the sorting out the bleeding and everything else. It's actually sorting out the whole of the society. And so with the foundation, you're right that what we try and do is set, do our courses and we train doctors and we extrapolate those doctors so if that one doctor over two weeks then learns how to do 20 cases then over the next year or so he's done so many cases and that's what we're trying to do is trying to instill the knowledge of of orthopedics and plastics and general surgery and so and so forth to try and reconstruct people not just reconstruct people but to try and reconstruct their lives yeah yeah that's that, that's beautiful and i'm going to come on to that actually later with some more in-depth questions now we've got deepa bose here saying uh david many consults and training and trainees in the uk are keen uh, to work in these countries and nurture these partnerships you're talking about for mutual benefit, but the structure of the NHS does not easily allow this. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you're quite right. And um, in fact, it's been very, I was quite lucky in one respect. So I had a, a job and colleagues who allowed me to go off at short notices. So if there was a war going on or something, or I listened to it on the media, I got a phone call from MSF or ICRC or Syria Relief or Palestinian Children's Refugee Fund saying, can you come tomorrow or can you come in the next few days? And I would go to the managers and I would say, look, uh, can I go for two to three weeks? And I used to then um, do my on call. So if people would cover my on call, I would cover their on call when I came back. I would, they would cover my clinics and I would reinstill the clinic sometimes they'd get locums in so i've been extremely lucky in my career being a being able to have had this niche now i didn't do a job plan i haven't got a job plan which says i can go off for three months a year or six weeks a year to go to this place that's not how it works it was basically by um goodwill of my colleagues and goodwill from the managers etc etc but times have changed and, and you're quite right, times have definitely changed and now it's very much more focused on the NHS um, helping the local community. And I, I don't think the managers get it right, actually. I think some of the managers don't understand what good you can do by going abroad and how important it is to be able to do this. And, you know, part of the, the time now, which I have, but um, I, I really want to, 
um, as time goes on, allow, we're running a train the trainers course to train people to come and work with us abroad. And we run lots of courses and so on, where you can get trained up to be able to understand what it's like to be a humanitarian surgeon. Um, but I think then what really needs to be written down is the chief executives and their conference, if they have it there, I think they do have a chief executive conference, they need to be able to understand that you need to let people breathe and you let, need to let people go out and explore life. It makes them a better person at the end of the day. So this is something that, that really needs to somehow be instilled into the, into the uh, managerial aspect of the NHS, which unfortunately I think is, is too blinkered at the moment to, to understand this, but let's work on it. Yeah, um, that's maybe something I can think about with my uh, Royal Society of Medicine hat. Maybe this calls for a roundtable at a later date, uh, more specifically in relation to integrating uh, the needs. Uh, John, John Carr Murrell says, hello, David, thank you for this evening. I became a medical student, partly as a result of reading your book. Uh, if you could give a medical student one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, gosh, well, good for you. And I'd like I'd like to change position with you if I if I could. And I'd like to uh, you can come and sit here, and I'll come a medical student again because I I really like to do the whole thing again. So what I, what I would say you need to do is enjoy medicine, enjoy doing what you're doing, um, and have things in the back of your mind. Always look around. Uh, the world is a huge place out there. It's it's waiting for you to come. And you just need to be able to um, be as good a student as you possibly can, pass all your exams like I didn't sometimes, but um, you need to be able to uh, really enjoy being a student and get as much information in your head as possible and uh, just um, await when you qualify and then just watch to see what's going on. Um, you've got a great future ahead of you. The doing medicine is, is the best passport you can ever have to go around the world. It will get you anywhere. It will get you into the most wacko situations, the most dangerous situations, the best situations. You'll see people that you was, uh, you never really realized that, that, that the, you, you had the potential to see those people. It's an amazing passport to life and the world. So look forward to it. Fantastic. I have never seen so many questions, David. This is amazing. And it's really a tribute to your work and, and your writing uh, that you have so many and so many young people on here. Uh, I've got Zeni Elshaw saying, how challenging would you say it is to develop a career that takes roles that combine NHS, military and humanitarian work if you could go back to yourself as a newly qualified doctor? What would you tell yourself? So I would tell myself that I've, I, I, am, I have become a doctor and I need to do a specialty. But, and that specialty is something that I will um, continue to do for all my life. So if you're you know, starting off, you've got 40 years of work of practice in the National Health Service, um, you need to develop what you really enjoy doing. So if it's some sort of specialty that you like doing, um, then go ahead and do it because that will be your life. Your life will be working as that person. But then you've got something else to fall back on. Um, humanitarian work is such that it's, it, you become a specialist in the NHS, so you're a specialist, but humanitarian work is not like that. I mean, humanitarian work is sometimes you're the only doctor uh, for hundreds of thousands of people around the place. So you've got to be able to be an obstetrician. You've got to be able to do cesarean sections. You've got to be able to treat children. You've got to be able to operate on children. And of course, as a surgeon in the UK, you don't have that facility to be able to do that because I can't in the UK operate on people under the age of 16. However, if I go abroad, 60% of my patients sometimes are under the age of 16. So how am I going to develop those? Well, you develop it by, by doing missions, you develop it by developing yourself, you go and watch operations, you go and uh, get a, a portfolio that suits yourself. And, and at the end of the day, as a humanitarian doctor, you are dealing with head problems, facial maxillary problems, tracheal problems, chest problems, orthopedics, pediatrics, obstetrics, um, you name it, eyes, et cetera. So you need to develop a, a, a sort of global um, response to the body, so to speak, really. And you need to understand 
the various specialties that you don't understand at the moment. They're not difficult because there's only a certain amount of things that you can do without specialized equipment. I mean, you, you, you can't do microsurgery, you can't do laparoscopic surgery, you can't do the surgeries that is renowned for being first world surgery, but you can do third world surgery, which is bread and butter surgery, which will allow that patient to survive his illness and put him back again. He may not have the best uh, fracture fixation. He may walk a bit funnily, but at least he's walking again. At least he's not had an amputation. At least you've, you've got him back on his feet. So it's, it's, it's a, a multi-specialty position and it's um, a multi-specialty situation, uh, which is completely different from a super specialty situation in the NHS. And you only know how to do that by come and come on our courses and talk to us. And we have a, we'll talk about it in a second, Henrietta, but I'm sure, but we have the foundation which you can go to. We run, uh, uh, actually, we'll come back to that because I think- we'll talk Yeah, about it. thank uh, you. Uh, um, yes, yeah. we will, we will. I'm gonna save it up for, I've got two more things I want to know from you and then we'll move on to the foundation. So when you look back across, you know, all the years and all these play, you, you, you've come across so many colleagues, some of them you knew well, others you work with as part of teams uh, in different countries you were just presented with. What personality traits or even just what, what character traits, let's call them, uh, have you seen helpful in people and what unhelpful? And you can give us examples if you want. So when I go somewhere, I, um, you don't go in as the big person that sort of knows a lot about things. What you have to go in with is being very subservient. If you go to war zone, um, and I missed the, the question before, which is about military as well. I'll talk about military if you ask me again about that, Henrietta. Um, but if you go to um, a war zone or you go anywhere where there are groups and groups of people, you'll find all personalities under the sun. And you'll find strong personalities, you'll find powerful personalities, you'll find nice people, you'll find aggressive people, you'll find all the things that, that you know about that, that the people that you meet you'll find all of them but the big issue is is that it's concentrated in a very emotional hyper emotional state because everybody's under pressure everybody's worried about their life everybody's worried about uh, their families everybody's worried about whether they're going to be able to get home etc so all those personalities the strong personalities the angry people the irritable they are absolutely 100 percent intensified so you will end up if you're not careful having disagreements that might be difficult for you to comprehend because the disagreement that you have will actually be something inside yourself that you want to get out but what you have to be you have to look at your own life really and you have to be able to understand that if I say something wrong if I don't toe the line slightly if I make a slight mistake then a telephone call can go and before you know it, your life can be over. Uh, it's so, so dangerous in that respect. And that's just the personalities. It's not to do with what's around you, et cetera, et cetera, because you're, you're going as somebody that's there to help. So what you have to be is extremely subservient and extremely diplomatic and don't say anything about religion, don't say anything about the political situation, you are there as a humanitarian, as a person that wants to help the patient that's in front. And you want to help assist the doctor that's going to do that. And, and it's a matter of uh, see, saying to the doctor that's, or the surgeon who may not be all that good, um, can I help you? And I will help you hold a retractor. I will help you do this and that and the other thing. And then after a while you say, oh, I actually, can I show you how to do this? Maybe that may be a bit better to do it this way rather than that way. And he will then, you will start to get his trust. He will start to get your trust. And before you know it, you start becoming friends. I mean, again, in Mareb recently, I mean, I was in a situation whereby the man had a gunshot wound to his uh, neck and the bullet, uh, he'd had it a few days before, maybe two or three weeks before. And the bullet was actually pressing on his esophagus. And every time he, ate something or drank something, 
uh, he couldn't swallow because the bullet was actually not eroding into the esophagus, but we're pressing into the esophagus. So I said to, and we looked at the scans and the CT, they had a CT scanner in, Ye in Yemen, uh, um, amazingly so, which was sort of working. And uh, I said to the doctors, they said, well, can you take it out? I said, well, I can take it out, but uh, do you want me to take it out? And they said, yes, we'd like you to take it out. So, so okay. So uh, in this war zone then, a few weeks ago, I had, uh, well, I don't know, maybe about 10 doctors watching. Um, but before that, um, the bullet looked to be somewhere near the cervical spine. And there was a, a sort of neurosurgeon there who then came into the operating theatre whilst the patient was being anaesthetized and started shouting at me and saying, you know, why are you going to make an anterior cervical fusion incision? And I said, no. You have got to make an anterior cervical fusion. You have got to. And so what do you do with that situation? So you're then, okay, this is not going the way it's planning. And then what he did, the patient was already anaesthetized. He picked up the anaesthetized patient who had had an endotracheal tube down. Yeah, no, seriously. And started throwing the patient on the operating table, you know, with, with attached to the anesthetic machine, trying to put him in the right position for the anterior. I said, look, I don't want to watch this anymore. If you want to do this operation, you do it. Um, don't touch the patient list because I'm going to go. So I walked out of the operating theater to be then followed by the 10 surgeons that came to watch the operation who then turned on this man and then he left and it was a really difficult situation but that situation is something that um i didn't want to get myself into but what you have to do you have to walk away you just have to walk away do not argue do not do anything it's his patient just walk away and I've done that many times. I've just walked into a quiet room or the toilet, sat, sat in the toilet, closed the door, locked it for a bit and then came out and the situation seems to get better. So that's a, a tragic soap opera story, really. Um, a, a, a horrendous uh, to, to, to think of you facing this over and over again from what you are from what you're saying uh, thank you for sharing that um uh, so 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 diametrically opposed then uh, we know that medics rely on their sense of humor uh, to get through some pretty difficult things uh, right from the start at medical school when sometimes we're overwhelmed um do you still have a sense of humor oh i think so i mean it, I, I i i'm not a stand-up comedian and can tell jokes uh, my jokes are pretty useless as i'm sure some people that are watching this know me very well are but i will it's all black humor and you know it's all it's humor that between medics and it's very difficult to for the general population uh, who are probably watching some of some are watching this as well to understand the sort of black humor that that we sort of have i mean just as an aside, there was when I was in Afghanistan, um, one of the doctors, uh, I wrote it in the book, one of the doctors was uh, severely fragmented and came in uh, with um, having been blown up with a rocket propelled grenade. And he had fragments in his head and in his face and in his chest and everything else. And uh, we call him Dr. Peppered. And, um, you know, after the drink, Dr. Pepper. But it's very black humor and it's it's sort of, very difficult to, I think, to sometimes understand um, if you're not really in it all the time. Absolutely. And um, <laughs> yes, and, and it was, I think it, it, it's good to know in a way that despite everything that you have lived, uh, that can still stay with you. That, that as you say, the medic sense of humour that you have uh, evolved through the years. So um, uh, my last question before we move on to the next section. Uh, there have been moments uh, when you might have wondered whether you might have managed to come home uh, because of uh, uh, situations. Would you share one or two moments that were very difficult and how you dealt with them? Yes. Uh, um, every time I, uh, I mean, even this time, I mean, um, I've got two children and um, you, I now have different responsibilities before I was married and had two children. I, I just, and in fact, if going back to some of the students and young people that are listening to this, it's very difficult to go abroad and go to a war zone when you have family and a wife and children. It is really difficult. So if you want to get it out of your system, 
do it before you get married and before you have children and before you've got a mortgage and all this sort of stuff that goes with it and school fees and blah 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 um do it do it as a, a young person and then what i mean as a young person you know you do have to be trained to do the job you do have to probably now be cut at, at consultant level you do have to uh, be able to go out if you are going to be a surgeon and operate and do a good job and do it safely and don't harm the patient which requires a significant amount of training and etc to be able to do that um, but go and do it before you get uh, married uh, and before you have children because your responsibilities change significantly and not only that something inside your head changes as well as something goes click and it's very difficult to go and I I remember um, just going this time I, I it's very funny I, I shouldn't really say this but there was a, there's times in your life which are really terrible and and there's there's some sort of sort of thing goes on in your head which uh, you yelp at and they usually are your parents dying and my father died and I had this when I was crying I had this funny yelp which was a strange yelp and I was listening to myself crying and it was so sort of, I've never heard that before and then my mother died and I had the same sort of funny yelp uh, that I was listening to as I was crying it was very strange and when I went off to Mareb this time um, I took the children to school and I came home and I was supposed to, the taxi was supposed to come at 10 o'clock <laughs> and Ellie was there and Ellie had to go off somewhere and so I was just in the house of, well no she was there as well and it happened again the yelp happened again and it was like it's this inner yelp of you know gosh I'm going I'm really you know I'm going somewhere uh, you know I want to come home I want to come back to see the children and you but I'm scared and it's a it's an emotional real difficulty so what I mean is go ahead and do it do all this before you have children because the responsibility and maybe the irresponsibility by going is too high and there have been times when I've been you know abroad and I've thought oh I've taken I've bitten too much off here I've really bitten too much off and one of those times I think I think there's been about 10 of those times but I think the, the most the, the time where I really felt that I was going to uh, go was I was in an operating theatre in Aleppo in 2013 and we were operating on a man who was shot uh, in the chest and he was upstairs on one of the wards and so uh, he had a chest drain put in and he had lots of blood coming out of the chest drain so they took me upstairs to have a look at him and I said yes he needs to go to the operating theatre uh, we'll take him now and of course, at the time in Aleppo, it was, it was a wonderful thing for me to be able to teach the doctors because um, they had never seen lots of the operations and never done any of the operations. Because in a war zone, what normally happens, the senior surgeons all leave, you're left then with a very uh, young cadre of patients that, uh, sorry, young cadre of doctors uh, that don't know how to do all the operations. Uh, they don't know how to open a chest and things like that. They don't know what to do when they've opened the chest. So it was a great opportunity for me to teach them about what do you do. So this patient came down to the operating theatre. Uh, we, I said to the Syrian surgeon, um, would you like to open the chest? He said, well, I've never done it before, so I'll show you. So I showed him how to open the chest. And when we, when we put the retractor in and opened the whole chest up, uh, it, it, the patient was significantly bleeding from the pulmonary vein, a, a massive he hematoma, which I put hemorrhage, which I put my finger on. It was same sort of uh, same sort of injury that Princess Diana died from, to be honest with you. Uh, so he put off my finger on it, and I was just about to ask for a I asked for a stitch to try and stitch the hole, and suddenly the door of the operating theatre flew open, uh, and six members of um, all dressed in black came into the operating theatre and it was six members of ISIS who were the um, the worst group ever. It was the Chechen Brigade, which were the notoriously brutal ISIS uh, contingent that were there. And I thought, oh God, this is, this is it. So as I was standing there, they were pointing their AK-47s at us. And we realized that uh, the patient on the operating table was an ISIS fighter. Wow. And the, 
the senior ISIS member came around, looked into the chest, and I thought, well, if they know that I'm British, if they know that I'm going to be taken out, and, and that is it. So I started to develop, my legs started to shake, my, I started to go into this total body shape, realizing, well, I've really done it now. This is, you know, I'm not going to get out of here. But uh, as it was, um, the Syrian surgeon told the uh, ISIS fighters that they asked who we were and he said well don't disturb the senior surgeon who's about to put the stitch in and don't talk to him because he's concentrating and so on so they didn't talk to me and I, I of course didn't say a single word and and then um, they were there for about an hour in the operating theatre with all their guns still pointing and some are on the floor some are sitting on the floor some are leaning over the operating table anyway um, something happened and then their, their, their um, walkie-talkie crackled and, and they all left. So that was one time where I, I went into this complete total body shape thinking that, you know, that was, that I wasn't going to survive yeah. this. Yeah. I have, uh, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm experiencing tachycardia just, uh, <laughs> just hearing you narrate this, but I, I just wanted to just take a moment to thank you for sharing uh, that deep, uh, sorrow uh, that you just shared with us and 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 want to say how how much empathy we, we you know we we have for, for that experience that human moment that you described and thank you for doing it tonight you know you didn't have to and and it, it means a lot for you to share it um on that note um i will move on actually to uh that, that, by the way there are now about 55 questions which we will <laughs> some of them will answer but but a lot of people are saying how much they want to help some uh, including fundraising for the for the foundation so i want to uh, seize the opportunity because there is so much energy on this uh, talk right now about all that you've done and how many lives not just the lives you've saved but all the colleagues you've influenced in terms of you know their their own professional lives and 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 their sort of human kindness really so there will be a lot of people after today who will be contacting the foundation we know that now from all the talks so so i want to talk hest hostile environment surgical training um now what is it uh, what is it? How does it work? And what do you do with it? And at some point, we're going to go on to the little film about the hearts. But right now, you know, I'm interested in the uh, I'm interested in what HEST is. And also you can talk about the global network. And while you're at it, talk about the foundation. Just go for it. OK, thank you. <laughs> I will. Um, so 25 years or almost more than that of uh, of in international humanitarian help, you learn lots of stuff and you learn about how to be a proper humanitarian surgeon and how how you can. And so I came back and I, Ellie said to me, she said, David, you've got all this knowledge and everything else. Why don't you start teaching people? And um, so I'd already started to do that in 2013 and I started running a course which is running again, started to run again now. The next course is in December of this year called the Surgical Training for the Austria Environment. And it's a course where I wanted to be able to take surgeons through that were specialized and de-specialize them, so to speak, really, and show them lots of scenarios. Because every time I go to a war zone or, or anywhere, I've got a GoPro stuck on my head and I record all the operations that I'm doing. So it's all to do with all the scenarios of what happens and, and how you manage these sorts of patients from really top right down to bottom. So um, I've, got, I've got banks and banks and banks of videos and photos and everything else. And so I put that all together for the surgical training for the austere environment. But Ellie said, uh, and, and of course that course costs about 2,000, 2,500 pounds to go on. And so, um, Ellie said to me, well, why don't you think of setting up your own foundation and then we can pay for surgeons to come from all over the world uh, to come on your course. So we started to do this in 2015 and we got charitable status of the David Knock Foundation. And what that does, it pays for surgeons. They, they, people apply for scholarships through the website and uh, we give them scholarships. So 14 every 
uh, course come from all over the world, the Congo, the Yemen, Libya, you name it, Af all places in Africa and Middle East and wherever. If we can get them visas, which we have a whole fantastic crew of uh, people that work for the foundation, getting all the visas, trying to go through the foreign office, getting all these people to come, all the surgeons and whatever to come to the UK. Uh, to come and um, and get this training. That's done on cadavers, so people who donate their bodies to medical science, they're all used for this way, and they're all used in a proper way how to train the doctors on plastic surgery, orthopedics, how to raise the flaps, how to do skin grafts, how to open the chest, how to do abdominal surgery, craniotomies, and how to wire jaws and faces, and how to deal with all this stuff. And then we also go to, um, the Royal College of Gynecologists, and they teach a whole day on obstetrics, how to deal with difficult obstetric problems. But what we wanted to do was to take this course and take it abroad and take it to people that can't come and can't leave their hospitals and can't come from the front line. So we would go, to, we will go to them. And so what I wanted to do was Obviously you can't take a cadaver with you. Um, so we wanted to create a cadaver or, or create a model that was exactly like a human being. So we have this six foot model that has about 50 operations on him, uh, absolutely lifelike and it's anatomically correct. So you open the chest, you see all the lungs, you see the, the three lobes in the right, two lobes on the left, you see the heart, you see the pericardium, you see the upper part, all the blood vessels, you see the arm which is dissected out, the carotid, do a craniotomy, you can open up uh, all this sort of stuff, face and uh, all the flaps and everything. So we take this body in two parts or this, and he's called Heston, uh, off the hostile environment so So he's called Heston. But not only that, we want to make it, it's in, I think it's important to run a course where people can come and sit and have spent five days with us, wherever it is in the world. Uh, we have a group of uh, a faculty that we've trained to come and then that's why we're running a train the trainers course to uh, get more people interested to come and train. Uh, but what we do have are, I think we've got one person working with us uh, for the foundation who used to work in Holby City, creating all the, the models for that. But he now works purely for us and he is fantastic. And what I wanted to do was to recreate all the models and all the simulation, for example, the intestines and the blood vessels, the heart and everything else. And I wanted to create things that we could take it abroad and say, okay, well, we haven't got um, a real person, but we've got the next best to a real person. So here's a here's here's the operation, and then and then we'll take a blood vessel and we'll put we'll sit them down, and we have all the faculty members going. Now this is how you stitch arteries together. This is the way you do it. This is how you dissect things out. And he makes all the simulation for us, and uh, and that's what we do. And I think you want to show a short video. And so sometimes in in uh, when we're doing this sort of surgery. There, there are very times whereby a gunshot wound to the chest or a fragmentation injury to the chest um, is out of bounds for the environment that you're at. Because if you don't have an intensive care unit, if you don't have the staff, then we tell people you don't start because your likelihood of survival is very poor. But having said that, if you're in the Yemen, for example, that does have an intensive care unit, if you're in various parts of Gaza or, uh, or any other places which do have intensive care units, and you do have the skills to do it, even though you've never done it, we will show you how to do it. And even the doctors that don't know how to do it won't have those skills. We will say to them, this is how you do it. So if you get a fragmentation injury, and I remember being in Syria in 2013, mm -hmm. and a young 12-year-old uh, boy came in with a fragmentation injury to his uh, chest, and it went into his heart, and he had a pericardial tamponade. And the doctors looked at me and they'd open his abdomen up and said, oh, we don't know what to do. I said, okay, let's open his chest up. So we opened his chest, we found the, opened the pericardium. He had a massive pericardial tamponade and we stitched up the heart and nobody had ever seen that before. So what we're doing is we're developing models which have simulation that they can do that on. And so we've developed this 3D model as well, which actually has blood flowing into the heart. It's pumped up the heart. 
and uh, they can make a hole in the heart and they can stitch it. And they may have never done that before, but we'll show them what, we'll show the doctors what it's like. And I, I, I think the video you wanted to show. So we've developed this, uh, this heart, which is realistic and this very lightweight, um, not very heavy at all, um, pump. At the moment, it's just pumping air, but it will pump uh, fluid. And it uh, pumps the fluid in so that you can, when you make a hole in the heart, it will bleed under a ventricular, of course, the right atrial, right ventricular pressure is only 25 millimeters of mercury, and left ventricular pressure is 120. But it will bleed at about 25 millimeters of mercury uh, pressure. And that's what you need to be able to stitch the heart. It's got this exactly the same uh, uh, thickness, and we'll show you how to deal with coronary vessels and so on and so forth. And it just, uh, you know, a thing that we, we have developed and are taking abroad on our test courses for people to understand how to do. Fantastic. Um, uh, would, you, would you carry on a little bit and tell, there are many people listening. First of all, there are compliments flying, saying what an incredible man you are, incredible foundation. How can they help? Several people want to know about the fundraising. Maybe you might say something now. I mean, who has found, who has managed to provide you with proper support? Has it been individuals? Has it been organizations? Well, thank you. Um, so it's quite interesting. I, I, um, I, I shouldn't really say this, but I, I was on a, uh, I won a BAFTA award uh, two weeks ago for uh, a thing we did with the ITV <laughs> uh, in Idlib. And um, I went on to Sky News and they asked me, um, so who funds your foundation? How much money do you get from the government? And how much... Uh, uh, do you think that government withdrawal of funds are going to affect your foundation? And I said, look, the beautiful thing about our foundation is that it is sponsored by the general public. It's sponsored by people that go onto the website. It's sponsored by people that hear what we do. Uh, and it's, uh, we get all the donations that we go into our foundation, go to make these models. They don't go to make anything else. It funds, obviously, the, 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 the missions for uh, students to come across to the UK. We fund all those people. Uh, we fund uh, the, the HEST, uh, all the models. I mean, each heart, one of those hearts will be about £300, believe it or not. They're not cheap. Uh, the Heston, the model that we created, uh, is four hundred thousand pounds. So we—it's uh, a lot of money. But we got a donation for that to make Heston, and we're now make—we're now in discussions of making Heston two and Heston three and so on. So we can take these models away. It's—it's it's an amazing piece of kit, um, but it costs a lot of money. And all the all the kits that we take, and we have kidneys and hearts and blood vessels, we have tracheas, we have lungs, we have livers, we have uh, uh, skulls, we have bones, we have external fixators, we have everything that you ever need to know about how to deal with a casualty or with an injury uh, that you can reconstruct in a war zone uh, or in a, an area of conflict accessory, we have simulated. And all the simulators are what cost the majority of the money to, to, uh, to make. And so we've got poor Max, who's sort of flat out making all these things, um, but he in hopefully enjoys his job. Um, but the money that is raised, 90% goes to making all our models and 90% of it goes to um, our courses and uh, the simulations. And we leave the simulations with the doctors. We leave them in the Congo, we leave them in, in in um, Yemen, in Misrata, we, we leave them in Syria. So they have all these models with them. So they know that we've been there. And we, we try and develop this uh, massive uh, community of doctors as well. And we hold, uh, and for all the students that are listening and all the young doctors, if you want to join us, it's starting again on September the 2nd. Um, and it's going to be on our website. We have meetings every two weeks where the doctors from all over the world will, produce, will, will uh, show their cases um, and we'll discuss their cases with them. And often they like to um, tell that they were on our course and this is what they did and this is how they've done. And some of the cases that they have are, are so um, difficult to manage that we actually get in, um, you know, I, the other day there was a massive ranula 
in a, um, which is a salivary gland type tumor, a salivary tumor in the floor of the mouth. And we see ones that are probably the size of a small tomato, but this was down here. And the professor of ENT had never seen anything like that in his whole life. So we got him to come on and discuss it with the, uh, the doctor from the Congo, how to do that procedure. And that doctor did that operation beautifully. And so it's a matter of, you can learn an awful lot by just listening to what the conditions that they have and, and how they're managed. And, and they love discussing their cases with us. Um, so that's happening every two weeks. It's a, it's a webinar, which you're welcome. Anybody is welcome to join. But the money that's, uh, I would say that we're trying to expand and expand and expand. And all the money that's uh, donated to the foundation, uh, of course, we have to pay for uh, those uh, that, that are working full time with us, um, but the, the rest of it goes on on the models and uh, travel and, yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Um, I, I've just had a thought because of the enormous number of questions that clearly we're not going to get through in time. I, I would suggest, having looked at your great website of the David Knott Foundation, that some of the people, particularly the ones who really wanted to offer support, might themselves get on, you know, we'll be tomorrow, we'll send an email to everyone who's participated with the details. Um, certainly, I'm extremely inspired and I'm a psychiatrist, you know, you've got no use for me whatsoever. And yet, you know, I'm thinking, has anyone ever done a musical fundraising for you? Because maybe I will. Has anyone done a very big opera or concert for you? Uh, no. Um, well, that's it. I've got a new job. That's great. Okay. But having, having said that, though, there, 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 are, there, there is a small opera company that wanted to do um, something for us. Uh, and I'm meeting them tomorrow on oh, wow. the Zoom. OK, this wasn't planned, everyone. I know you think this is staged, but we had not discussed it before. But <laughs> I, um, I, I really mean this, David. I will take this on and, and, and do some fundraising for you. I really mean that. Uh, now, uh, I feel that there are two things really I want to do. Uh, one is um, uh, that I do know that you, you spoke about your parents very briefly, but I do know from uh, past uh, uh, readings uh, that becoming a doctor was not as clear cut as all of that and that your dad did have quite a big influence. And I just wondered whether, you know, going back to your early career in terms of your studying, and this is really because there was something about the determination that came through and the fact that sometimes, you know, our after all, if he hadn't been there pushing you from behind, you might not have taken the flight that you needed to take. And, and that meant a lot when I was reading. Um, I can't even remember where, where it was I read it, but, uh, but I wonder whether you might just briefly sort of say how it felt to sort of be handheld really through the initial stages of becoming good at sciences and being able to go forward. Yes, uh, I mean, my father, um, he, um, you know, all fathers are fantastic people, but my father was, a, to me, was a fantastic person. He, he was born in uh, Mandalay in Burma, um, and he was half Burmese, and he, um, during the Second World War, he escaped the Japanese coming into uh, Burma, and he walked hundreds of miles with his family. He was a young teenager. He saved his uh, um, younger brother, he, he saved his mother crossing rivers and so on that were swollen with uh, monsoons and malaria. His brother actually died, uh, he got caught uh, and was on the Burma Siam Railway uh, and died uh, and, and is buried in one of the cemeteries in, in Thailand. Um, but uh, he was uh, a, an amazing person and I was a useless student, I was hopeless. And I, I, I wasn't very clever at school. And uh, I think now I think I, I know why, because there's something in the Times I was reading it last week or so that I was born in late July and uh, I was a year behind everybody. So that's my, that, that's <laughs> what I can say for that. Um, but I was, uh, I think, and, and I was hopeless at school. I was hopeless. And um, I remember I had this crazy thing on flying and I really enjoyed, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'd like to do, do this. And, um, so anyway, I got something, I got, I think, two, three E's at A-level. I was really bad. And um, I came home and um, 
anyway, I, I, I thought to myself, then somebody rang me up and said, uh, Dave, what's it, what's it like to be a failure? And because everybody in my class went off to university and, and I thought, I, and my dad sat down with me and said, David, do you, do you really want to feel like a failure or do you really, really want to you know, get on and do it? So I said, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. He said, get on and do it. So I'll be behind you. So he was behind me and he really shone, shone a fantastic light and said, Dave, I'm going to help you you know do this and and sometimes he would sit in the room with me and we'd talk about physiology we would talk about stuff and he was instrumental in changing my three e's to three a's uh and um then i went into to got into medical school Amazing. so he he was a yeah yeah a very and, and and you know i needed that push i needed somebody to say to me that you're not a failure you know and it, it then made me determined to prove to everybody that I wasn't the thicker at the back of the class. Absolutely. And the better you did, the more motivated you were, the more successful you became. And I think that's just such a beautiful way in which to draw towards the close of the evening. I'm really glad you shared that. So I'll just pick a few of the things people are saying. Thank you, uh, Ramsh Ahmed, thank you so much for an extremely inspiring and insightful session and honor. Uh, a real honor to be to be listening. Um, Marini Edwards, thank you for sharing your humanitarian work and your personal reflections. Your book was inspiring. Um, someone else, uh, Ahmed Osman, saying excellent lecture, great work and courage. Uh, uh, someone saying, um, besides financial, what other kinds of help does a foundation need? You might say two words about that. Well, um, we always, you know, we are a fledgling foundation, really. We've been doing it for five years now, and we, we're getting, you know, uh, getting our feet on the ground now. I, I'm, I'm writing the Global Surgery book in the Oxford University Press. They just give me the green light for that. So there'll be a book available for people to read and go on. But there are other things. If you want to contact our foundation, of course, you know, there are things which I don't know about myself. And there are things that if you feel that you, you, you know, feel that you want to get involved, then we have Rebecca, who is fantastic, and Harry, who's fantastic, who are, uh, and John, who, who are there to listen to what you want to talk about. Um, and if you want to offer us anything, then, then they'll be there to listen to you. I mean, I can't think of anything on the top of my head being so glued into what yeah. I'm doing, yeah. but uh, I'm sure they'll, be Rebecca, delighted. Rebecca's listening and she'll be on to you. I'm sure she's looking at the chat. Now, someone who's disappeared from the chat said, uh, amazing courage, determination, uh, hu human kindness. Uh, why have you only got an OBE? You deserve much better. Absolutely. You know, on your way to a knighthood, you absolutely deserve it. Fully agree with that. Um, uh, and uh, some people saying that they really want to work on the whole concept of the NHS, allowing people to to work um, uh, in the way that you have done uh, off your own back and, and you know encouraging people to do that uh, now with uh, one minute to go um, uh, Alice Huang says how do you find the courage I think it's innate to be honest with you I think it's innate I think that um, you know I, my it, it comes from it comes from your parents it comes from your genes it comes from you know your reality of i mean i, I got brought up with my grandparents my mamgi and daki in the uh, trelech in south wales and you know the, the 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 beauty of being around people that you love and so and so forth and just being you know trying to go out and help people and it, it's it's not so much courage it's so much the passion of of what you do and I think it's if you, you can develop a passion in life, then uh, you really develop it. And that, that's why I hope I've, I've done. Beautiful, beautiful advice on which to end. So, so David, I have um, I have a quote that I found um, uh, linking it back to the conversation about um, your father. And uh, that that quote is. I was no longer the boy at the bottom of the class, the boy who had no future. 
And I thought, my goodness, my goodness, that is so true. And what a future you've created for yourself. So I feel that the world, and I'm sure everyone on this uh, large audience feels the same, that the world owes a big thank you to you and your father for making you into the doctor that you are. And your legacy will be a testament to his paternal love, I think. Um, and on that note, we will finish. And I'd like to uh, thank you from everyone and to encourage people to donate tonight, not just to the RSM for our educational purposes as usual, but also and very much to the David Knott Foundation. I hope you're all gonna to come to the massive concert, opera, whatever I'm going to be organizing for them in the autumn when we can all be together. And let me just remind you before I click off, uh, tomorrow there is a COVID webinar uh, that uh, will feature top experts uh, uh, like Neil Ferguson. And there's a climate change webinar that will be coming up on Tuesday with Nick Watts. Uh, there is next week's ICL um, conversation live uh, with Celia Kitzinger, and that will be uh, Roger Kirby, our president, doing that. And the wine tasting has been postponed and will now be online on the 1st of July. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to uh, wish you all good night and thank you for joining us. And, and David, thank you again and good night to you as well. Bye bye. Good night. Thank you.